Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Seeds and Weeds podcast, brought to you by Small House Farm. If you're looking to celebrate plants and the people that love them, then this is the podcast for you. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen. Howdy, friends. Welcome back to the show. We got something extra groovy planned for you today. I'm going to be sitting down to chat with Jennifer Jewell, who's a garden writer, educator, and host of the incredibly popular podcast, Cultivating Place. Now, Jennifer's got a new book out. It's called What We Sow on the Personal, Ecological, and Cultural Significance of Seeds. We had a great conversation, so I'd like to get right into that here in a minute. I do have some fun stories to share with you about our uh, recent trip to the Heirloom Expo, but my interview with Jennifer went a bit longer than usual. So for the sake of time, I'm going to save those stories until next week. But I got to tell you, that seed swap was unreal. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. Heather and I have been organizing the seed swap at the Expo for a couple years now, but it has never been this wild. It was just an absolute blast. Before we get into the interview, a quick shout out to our new Patreon subscribers. You all are awesome. We wouldn't be able to keep making the show without your support, so we really appreciate each and every one of you. If you like what we're doing here on Seeds and Weeds, you can always show your support by joining the Patreon. There's a whole slew of benefits and perks for signing up, and you can find all of that info over at seedsandweedspodcast.com, or, you know, the link is down in the show notes. This week, we're saying thanks to Kathy I, Gwendolyn P., and Kimberly G. Thank you so much, and welcome to the community, my friends. Jennifer Jewell is a gardener, garden writer, and gardening educator. Since 2016, she has written and hosted the national award-winning weekly public radio program and podcast, Cultivating Place. She's particularly interested in the intersections between gardens, the native plant environments around them, and human culture. Jennifer, I am so excited to have you here. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. Now, you've got a brand new book out. It's called What We Sow on the Personal, Ecological, and Cultural Significance of Seeds. And we're definitely going to dig into that here in a minute. But to get us started, you know, our listeners are probably very familiar with who you are. Uh, You're the host of the very popular podcast, Cultivating Place. So could you introduce yourself to the folks at home, maybe a little bit about the podcast, um, your work, and what has led you to this moment in time? Again, super happy to be here. I'm Jennifer, Jennifer Jewell, the voice behind Cultivating Place, conversations on natural history and the human impulse to garden. We're coming up on, I think, 400 episodes of this. So I'm like one of the old ladies of the podcast world, uh, which is good. I'll, I'll wear that mantle with with great pride. I, You know, I started my program originally as just a locally based radio program in Northern California, interior Northern California. And The whole premise when I started that first program back in 2007 was to elevate and expand the way we think and talk about gardening. So to talk a little bit more about why we garden than how to garden and a little bit more about the impact and meaning of our gardens than about how beautiful they can look in, uh, you know, seconds that we take a photo and then we get it up on Instagram. That's great. And we all love that. But that isn't really why we're out there 24 seven, 365 days of the year, slogging through mosquitoes and mud and bugs and all the things we do that make us actually love the relationship of gardening. So that That's the premise behind Cultivating Place is trying to expand what we think of when we say the word garden and what a gardener looks like and the the power we have in this world to make a difference. So we're, we're at this moment in time because I had a moment in March of 2020 where I was trying to order seeds. And as a lifelong gardener, mother of a prof- uh, daughter of a professional gardener, mother of two young adult gardeners and daughter of a wildlife biologist, I didn't understand enough about the seed supply chain and distribution and care in our world to expand explain why we kept getting out of stock, back ordered, not available signs on the seeds we were trying to order as just ordinary home gardeners in the world. And that set me on this two year research project into how seed is produced, stored, cared for and protected for the future the way it has been for hundreds of thousands of years by the humans before us. Like where have we gone wrong and where are we going right? That's why I am right here right now talking to you about what we sow, Bevan. 
Um, we grow seeds on our farm, small house farm here, um, very small scale seed production. And in February and March of 2020, we sold more seeds on our website than I had sold in the last five years combined. Exactly. And that was a real like aha moment, wasn't it? It was an aha moment. It was also like an uh oh moment. Uh-huh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's why I wanted to know more, right? Because it was the small seed producers like you, small scale that saved us over those next two years. It wasn't the big people. It wasn't the governments. It wasn't the large supply chain coming out of whoever knows where. It was on the ground, local networks and economies of seed savers, seed growers and seed sharers that reminded us exactly what is essential about seed and exactly the systems we need to support and recognize if we want to go forward safely and securely with respect, environmentally, economically, and socially. It was a fascinating intersection. Mm, yeah, you know, I totally dig that. I do a lot of work uh, with seed libraries here in Michigan. And I think that you're you're hitting the nail right on the head here when it comes to, a, um, I don't want to use the word crisis, but let's say a serious situation. We have to learn. And what we learned, I think, in 2020, what you talk about in this book is that it really comes back to community. If we need to find somebody and count on somebody, it's all about community. And and when we use that word community, it like seed is actually a, a small container for a large amount of things. Like it is plant communities. It is animal communities. It is human communities. And it's these three reintegrating in order to actually keep the best possible outcome front of mind as we move forward. Because I think really... And I think this is true of us as home gardeners or me as a home gardener, certainly, Bevan, that, you know, from sort of 19, let's say 75 to 2005, I think the mainstream garden world, gardeners, garden media, uh, garden educators, I think we sometimes took our eye off the ball or off the seed, as it were. And we need to harness this moment of real energy and interest and attention, and we need to keep it going. Doug Tallamy described your book as a fascinating discourse on seeds. And I would totally have to agree with what he says here. So it got me wondering, are you a seed saver too? Do you save a lot of seeds from your garden? I save a lot of seeds from my garden and I save a lot of seeds from the wild la land around me. Now, am I like an uh, economically viable seed saver? No, Bevan, but I try and save what I can, especially from those plants or crop plants that I want to plant again or I want to experiment with or I'm hoping to maybe propagate as a, you know, an interesting native plant to incorporate into my garden. I'm a very like singular. I do this with my partner, John, so it's not like I'm singular, but it is just a single gardener and their interest. But I would say, and I think you would agree with me there at Small House, that it is the action of us individually that aggregated is actually going to make a difference in what we see and how beautiful we see it and how we then share that forward that that is what's going to keep the momentum of seed held in the commons and cared for respectfully. That is how we're going to keep it going. I like that a lot. So it's like the community experience is really just where all of our individual experiences overlap. I think so. Yeah. So, you know, what we saw, it just came out from Timber Press, but it is certainly not your first book. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about some of your previous titles? Uh, this is my third book. My first book, The Earth in Her Hands, 75 Extraordinary Women Working in the World of Plants, was actually published in March of 2020. And it was while I was on book tour for the publication of that book. You all remember March of 2020, right? So I was on this book tour and I was supposed to be out on the road, John and I, for nine weeks. And because of the time frame for that talk, we uh, that book tour, we didn't plan our spring garden. And when we were shut down about two and a half weeks into the tour, that's when we realized like we needed to order seed. So that book tour was actually the epiphany and seed, if you will, that germinated into this book. But that book, interestingly enough, like doing the research for what we sow made me look back in hindsight at all the work I have done on cultivating place since 2016, even in that very first year of cultivating place, something like the first 10 
to 15 episodes, almost half of them were devoted to seed keepers. And I hadn't really noticed this as like a theme or a compelling line of inquiry in my own life. But then when I looked at the earth in her hands, there are like seven women who are seed keepers. Like that was a line of inquiry. Where are women in leadership helping to direct or redirect our seed world? And then in my my second book, Under Western Skies, which was a collaboration with photographer Caitlin Atkinson and profiles over 40 gardens across the U.S. West that are shifting the paradigm for what is beautiful and starting with ecologically well-designed climate and place-based gardens. In that book, there was a whole cohort of those gardens that were all based on local ecotype seeds or regionally grown and adapted edible seeds. And so to like see this line weaving through my work up until what we sow has been really interesting. But I would also say that everything I do, write, talk about, interview on my podcast comes right back to this idea of engaging with gardeners across the globe and empowering them, emboldening them and encouraging them to like really really live into the full power of what it means to be a gardener. Because as Amy Stewart, wonderful gardener, garden writer, uh, like beautifully irreverent has to say, it's just gardening is a whole lot more than just pretty throw pillows. I totally agree. And you know, that, what an interesting thing that you're getting at here, I think, is, you know, all these different gardeners from these different places that grow in different plants, different different histories, the cultures, cuisines, all these differences. But the one thing that every gardener everywhere has in common is the need for seed. The need for seed. And, and it's not just Right. Like you when you really think about it, because seed is so prevalent in our world and it's all around us. It's you know, it's the rice and the wheat and the oatmeal we eat. It's the uh, basis for our our vegetable gardens, but it's also the basis for our ecosystems all around us. So, you know, Doug Tallamy, the wonderful work he's doing, trying to get us to focus on, you know, caterpillars, the, this like the lowest person or life on the, the food chain and how important that. That one element is to the rest of the food chain flourishing, uh, especially in the way of birds. But when you think about our plant ecosystems, right, 300,000 angiosperms. So those are the flowering plants of the seed bearing plants. 300,000 of them that have been co-evolving on this planet for 365,000 years. Their seed is encoded with a whole lot of adaptation and knowledge that we could use. And and it is the basis of our food, our ecosystems, and so much of just our our fiber, our our building materials, our medicines, like you name it. The seeds are what add all spice to life. And to not take good care of them or to isolate them into being owned genetics by the four largest petrochemical pharmaceutical companies is an enormous mistake. And we can we can change that. We have the power. You know, I love Doug Tallamy. Uh, of course, I, I've read his books. And one time I was lucky enough to see him give a presentation at a local gardening conference. He was talking about uh, native plants was his, his theme. But it really, like you said, the native plants support the ecosystem of the insects, which supports the birds. And he illustrates this incredible web that all comes off of these plants. And the presentation for me, you know, I'm up to my elbows in seeds. We do a lot of seed work here. But to see the impact that the garden has from such a different angle from these right. insects like that, it, oh, it blew my mind, right? Yes. I think that your book will do something very similar for gardeners who have not seen things from the perspective of seed. Oh, I appreciate that is very high praise, Bevan. Thank you. And one of the things I really liked about the book, it sort of jumps back and forth between the narrative of the story and then excerpts from your journal. Um, you know, so it, as it kind of moves throughout the year, you know, as you're reading out of the journal and then the story is how it relates to that. Uh, I thought it was a really good illustration of the cyclical nature of seeds, how we kind of follow the seeds throughout their journey like that. Uh, could you dig into that just a little bit more, like your motivation for writing the book and specifically why you decided to approach it the way that you did? You know, I think when you think about this tiny word seed and the tiny thing 
everything that it often is relative to what it grows into. It was an enormous topic. And the more that I was digging into these different areas that I didn't know enough about, whether that was, you know, the socio and economic history of seed catalogs or the consolidation of commodity seed into these four big petrochemical pharmaceutical companies or the, you know, the impact and evolution of seed banking on our planet from, you know, the doomsday vault uh, up in the Svalbard archipelago to our local like California Botanic Garden or there in Michigan, whatever the seed banks are for your region. There was just so much that I couldn't, it was like too big to, to chew all at once. So one of the things that kept grounding me and grounds me in my life always is just being in sync with the seasons and the cycles of the plants in my garden and in my immediate environment. My, my partner, John, lives about 30 minutes outside of town and is on uh, a big piece of property that's a lot of wildland, oak woodlands and uh, pine forest and grasslands and a little creek. So there's a beautiful riparian corridor. And just sometimes the world gets overwhelming, right? So you go out and you play in the garden or you take a walk on the road and that brings you back to ground, if you will. And so that is the, the mechanism I used to help me stay focused on why I was writing this book and and why it was beloved and important to me, not just me wagging my finger at the world saying you should do this, but reminding myself of the great joy and connection I feel when I am the best kind of gardener I can be. And I consider like walking in our native environments, that in a way is like some kind of gardening, Bevan. That's some kind of attention and energy exchanged with the place I live that is a form of cultivation in my experience. And so those um, interludes of how and why this is personally important kept me on task. And I think from readers that I've heard from, it helps to break up these bigger, denser pieces of research that are sometimes so depressing, like the information about insecticides and pesticides covering our seeds. And, you know, like the Xerces Society just reported recently that in Trying to find neonicotinoid free milkweed across the country, they had a great deal of trouble because even organically grown or wild sown uh, milkweed plants are often contaminated by the soil or water around them with these persistent chemicals. Like that is so depressing. But at the same time, when you return to the, the amount of vibrancy and diversity and abundance in our very own seed sheds. It reminds you why we just keep going, starting from where we are, starting from just one little seed sometimes. Mm. You know, I think that what you said about how the journal entries were like um, almost like an escape from some parts of the story, you mm-hmm. know, to, like a, a relief to be able to, oh, ah, we're back, you know, right, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I experienced that reading the book. I, I yeah. can agree with that. I, I felt the same way that there was places where it, it was so peaceful to kind of come with you on your journey as you took your walk or you explored, you know, watching the seeds develop or whatever it does that was so joyful and it really yeah. helped counter um, some, so how heavy some of that other right. stuff that was happening. I mean, it's not, it's, not an easy book. And there's a section like maybe the beginning will feel a little easy and a little poetic, but then you're going to hit this chunk in the middle that's just, it's dense and it's hard. And so it's really easy to probably set it down and be like, okay, I can't do this. But I would encourage anyone who really cares about our garden world to just push through if you can, because you will get to the other side of how many like great, joyful, fierce seed keepers are out there doing the work we need them to do. And that's okay. Like we are gardeners. We do hard things. I think it's part of our obligation 
and inherently part of the joy we we derive from this, that we understand where we're being complicit with things we don't want to be complicit with. The book does get heavy, but I think it's also, there's parts of it that are very entertaining. I found it to be, you know, obviously inspirational. There was parts of it that were really educational too, where you like break out of the story for a minute to teach us something. Like at one point early in the book, you like stopped everything and you're like, okay, now we have to learn about the botany of seed dispersal. How do these seeds get out into the world? And it was so refreshing. I really loved how you were doing that, you know, really making sure you were building that foundation of knowledge. So there was more than just, you know, doom and gloom and joy and inspiration. There was like workable, useful data that, you know, that we could come back to. So many good stories throughout the whole book. So I got to ask for you, if you could pick one, what was one of your favorite stories from the book? Wow, that's a tough one, Bevan. You know, I I think that there are uh, probably four or five seed keepers um, from John Dickey, who's in charge of the Millennium Seed Bank in England, to Christina Walters and Stephanie Green, who are chief scientists at the USDA, to Rowan White here in Northern California, and Vivian Sansour, who is the founder of the Palestine Heirloom Heritage Seed Library. The stories from these individuals who all take joy in this work, and and like, so Rowan White is the founder of the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. Her network of of indigenous people across North America working to rehydrate, that's her word, rehydrate their own knowledge of seed care and their knowledge of the culturally important seeds that have fed their communities across hundreds of thousands of years going back, right? Those stories of them finding even one seed that is recovered from like a seed bank or, you know, a vault at some natural history museum is like hearing the story of someone meeting their grandmother or their great grandmother for the first time. And just like a seed germinating Every one of those stories kind of gave me goosebumps and reminded me of like this miraculous partnership between humans and seeds that has been going on for time immemorial. The cultural seed keepers often refer to seeds as prayers and lessons from the past handed down to the present in order to move it into the future. And this continuum, right, of just embodied knowledge and love and nourishment. That right there is is exactly why I slogged through two years and more of research and writing in order to share some of these names and stories forward. It's totally worth it. Totally worth the slog. You know, the the characters throughout the book, the different sea keepers and, and activists and folks that you get to meet, I mean, it reads like a regular who's who of the seed saving world. There were so many incredible people that you touched on. And quite a few of them I know personally. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. So it was extra fun for me reading the book and I'd be like, oh, you know, um, these familiar names. And it, I loved how you took all of these different people's stories and seamlessly weaved them into this greater tale that you were telling. So for me, it made me realize that, well, in reality, all of these small stories actually are one large story. And it's a story that we're all part of it. That is right. And that is the connection that if we see it, right, if we see that web of Vivian to Rowan to Stephanie to John to Jeff to to Ken, like to Bevan to Jennifer, right, if we see this web, we feel so much more optimistic. And that right there empowers us to just keep doing what we're doing where we are and adding to the web that I really think is the safety web for us environmentally, socially and ecologically and economically moving forward. I, I, I really believe that. I agree with you 100%. And now that this book's out, you're, it seems like you're already a very busy person, but this book's out, you're going to be on tour. There's going to be a lot going on for you. What is in store next for Jennifer Jewell? Uh, what do you see on the horizon? Really hoping for a little bit of a dormancy this winter, Bevan, so that I can sleep with the seeds and uh, recuperate a little bit. But, um, you know, I... 
I've been doing the podcast for a really long time and it never stops energizing me. So the, the, the podcast is in the works for the foreseeable future on and on the radio stations um, where it is syndicated across the country. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe come 2026, we'll see a, a 10 years of cultivating place overview what we've learned or, um, you know, insights from from the past 10 years. Uh, but I'm not I'm not sure. Hopefully I have a just really knock out spring garden next year because I've been a little busy this year to pay full attention to the garden. It would be nice to just have some time and relax out in the garden, wouldn't it? It would. It would. That's absolutely awesome. This has been a blast, Jennifer. How can folks find you that want to connect with you online? Well, cultivatingplace.com is where you can find the podcast every week. You can find a lot about books. Um, you can order books from there, but of course, the books are all available wherever you get your books. If you order a book of mine from anywhere, although I would suggest an independent bookstore, by the way, uh, but wherever you order your books, if you send me an email, cultivatingplace at gmail.com, I would be so super happy to send you a signed book plate in the surface mail back to put in your book. You can find me on Instagram. That is my social media platform of choice because I only have so many hours in the day. That is cultivating underscore place. I would love to connect with anybody there. That's where I share like pictures and podcast posts and, you know, just chat with other gardeners in um, a more casual and cheerful way. And there you go. That's that's those are all the places you can find me. Bevan. What we sow on the personal, ecological, and cultural significance of seeds. The brand new book from Jennifer Jewell is now available everywhere the books are sold. Jennifer, this has been too much fun, my friend. Thank you again for being on the show with us. Uh, I look forward to getting you on my program. Thank you for the opportunity. And here we are once again at the end of another show. Thanks to Jennifer Jewell for being our guest and to all of you for tuning in. Remember, if you'd like to support the program, you can always subscribe to the Patreon. You can find that link and many more at seedsandweedspodcast.com. This episode was edited and produced by all of us here at Small House Farm. And the music you're enjoying right now is the jazz piano of Oleg Kirikov. Thanks again, my friends. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen. Keep planting those seeds and we'll see you next time. 